think we're good to go. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Elaine Orbein, and I am the Executive Director of the Pediatric Chairs of Canada, as well as the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. It's my pleasure um, on behalf of PCC today, on behalf of the Pediatric Chairs of Canada, and our partnership with our program directors to welcome everyone to today's webinar. And, and as per the slide in front of you, making patient safety a priority in your program and organization is really what we have themed today's webinar. Um, I'm here with uh, my colleague in the PCC office, Lisa Stromquist, who I know everyone is very familiar with, at least by email. And Lisa is our patient safety liaison and national coordinator. Before we, uh, we get started, I, I thought it would be a wonderful opportunity just to do a very quick roundtable of our colleagues who are online with us today. And I've, I've got a list of uh, folks in alphabetical order who have, uh, who have joined us today on the webinar, and perhaps we can just say hello to each other and we'll do a quick uh, uh, cross-country uh, check-in. So Adele, can I uh, ask you to start, please? Uh, thanks, Elaine. I guess I'm always first, in whether you go by first or last name. That's right. Um, so my name is Adele Atkins, and I'm the uh, Program Director for Core Pediatrics in Toronto. And it's fantastic to have you with us on, on the call today. Thanks, Adele. And Andrea. Is Andrea Hunter online with us? All righty, we'll come back. Angelo, I know you're there. It's Angelo Microgenakis. I'm the Chief of Emergency Medicine at the Alberta Children's Hospital in Calgary. Okay, and welcome to you, Angelo. It's great to have you dial in. Thank you. Antonia. Yeah, hi. It's Antonia Stang. I'm a clinician researcher at the Alberta Children's Hospital uh, and interested in patient safety research. And welcome, Antonia. I know I owe you an email. No problem. <laughs> uh, is Ralph online with us? Yes, I am. It's Ralph Rothstein at British Columbia Children's Hospital, where I'm the acting department head. Welcome, Ralph. It's great to have you online with us as well. Thank you. And uh, Robin Erickson? Uh, Robin Erickson, pediatric nephrologist in, uh, at the University of Saskatchewan. Okay, fantastic. And welcome to you, Robin. It's great to have you online. Um, I'm wondering if I could turn to, to Lennox, please. Sure, it's uh, Lennox Wong. I'm the chair in chief at McMaster University. And welcome, and uh, Lennox is going to be one of our speakers on today's webinar, and Anne. Anne Matlow, um, Sick Kids in Toronto. Okay. And Sue. Uh, Sue Talla, Chief of Education at Sick Kids in Toronto. Wonderful. So welcome to everyone. Um, have we not had a chance to say hi to someone who is online and or joining us by webinar? Okay, we're probably going to hear a few more beeps. I think we're expecting a few more people, but at this point, it truly is my pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to everyone and to thank you for being a part of today's um, event. It is a very important um, area, and, and uh, patient safety, I know, is near and dear to everyone on, on the call today. And we're really looking to, as colleagues, to really help us promote and disseminate information around this new curriculum that has been developed, this online curriculum. And I thought just before we um, uh, turn things over to, to Lennox, I'll give you just a, a brief, uh, just a brief overview of, of um, the work and, and the, the journey that we've taken thus far to bring us to today. Um, in terms of an agenda for today's webinar, um, Lennox, uh, Wong from McMaster is going to is going to do a brief presentation, really focusing on um, the importance and ultimate impact on child health and safety, um, and really again the importance of building that safety curriculum, uh, importance of um, of patient safety from a Canadian pediatric perspective, and and again I know that everyone uh, will relate to that. Uh, Lisa is then going to walk us through a hands-on demonstration, um, not very long, but really sort of from a high level, but I think um, you just to, for you to appreciate the tool, and that is the um, curriculum on the go, 
that lives now um, certainly in a live state on um, CAFC's Knowledge Exchange uh, Network platform. Anne Matlow is then going to bring the third, um, rather the second presentation, looking very at a very important area around the importance of faculty engagement, experiences and challenges of bringing patient safety to our respective organizations, and perhaps um, lead us in a discussion on how we can engage our colleagues and our faculty members, as well as perhaps bringing some um, uh, experiences on, uh, on and sort of experience from Anne's perspective on how, in fact, she has been successful in, uh, in bringing patient safety to a greater profile within um, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Okay, so without any, any further ado, just to, to give you um, a little bit of, of, of a sense of um, where we're going, just I'm going to flip to the next slide, this one. All right, there we go. Um, the curriculum on the go is really based on a very important publication by the Canadian Patient Safety Institute in the fall of 2008, and that is the safety competencies as you, um, as you see it before you. There are six domains that are described in great detail within the safety competencies, and they refer to a, uh, they contribute to a culture of patient safety, and my apologies for the typo. Adele, you'll recognize this slide. Uh, domain number two is uh, refers to working in teams for patient safety. The third domain uh, focuses on communication, communicating effectively for patient safety. Managing safety risks is the fourth. Optimizing human and environmental factors. And finally, the sixth domain, recognizing, responding, and reporting on adverse events. The, uh, the framework within these six domains um, so has 20 key competencies. There are 140 enabling competencies, 37 knowledge elements, 34 practical skills, and 23 essential attitudes. And again, I'm sure that most online are very familiar with the uh, CPSI publication. If anyone isn't, and um, it is available uh, through the CPSI website. It's also uh, linked through to the uh, PCC and CAFC websites. And if all of that fails for you, just holler and we can make sure that everyone uh, gets a copy of it. How did our work and where did our work begin? Really, it began in 2009. And the goal was to, in fact, develop a Canadian safety curriculum for our residency programs. And I really want to recognize the leadership and participation of all of our program directors from across, uh, across the country. Um, a very important partnership began in that year as well, and that partnership was between the Pediatric Chairs of Canada, our program directors, and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. We established a key leadership committee, and that is our steering committee, of patient safety experts, program directors, residents, as well as representatives from our uh, pediatric chairs of Canada. Um, it's important to say that until this point, um, there was no Canadian model. There are um, models that do exist in terms of a safety curriculum uh, through IHI Open School, the Institute of Healthcare Innovation, as well as the WHO. I do want to share with you members of our Patient Safety Competency Steering Committee. A um, few members are online with us today. Ellen Wood from the IWK, and Dalhousie, uh, Sue Tallett, uh, who's online with us today, Adele Atkinson, Dana Bell, Maya Haz, as well as Don Hartfield from Edmonton. Jonathan Cronick, um, Pierrette Leonard from the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, and Matt Lau, Heidi McClintock, uh, and Lisa and myself. And, and uh, um, I don't want to forget uh, Sophia um, Hugh from uh, McMaster. I try not to do that. So just very quickly, um, our steering committee met twice a month 
um, put in a tremendous amount of work, and again, I, I must recognize that leadership. An environmental scan of current practices was done, focused on, uh, we focused on key competencies and um, began to um, work collaboratively um, through an online document, um, um, again, allowing people to participate and contribute um, based on their own time schedules, et cetera. And um, that work uh, in the development phase sort of carried us through uh, January to June of 2009. And then we brought a concept, a, a draft, if you will, of the curriculum on the go to a meeting with the majority of our pediatric resident uh, program directors across Canada, as well as uh, many other partners in, uh, in June of that year. The outcome of that June workshop truly was um, we were able to reach consensus um, on the curriculum. There was also um, a request and, and, and tremendous support in our moving forward to develop an online safety competencies curriculum that would include and now does include um, very pertinent and relevant PowerPoint presentations, case studies, facilitator guides, videos, references, links, many links to other resources, as well as guidelines for teaching across the six domains that we referenced a few moments ago. April of 2010, we went live and launched our online curriculum on the go um, that we refer to as a moderated community of practice. Lisa Stromquist is our moderator, and that community of practice lives on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network platform, as I mentioned. It is a wiki-based interactive online community, and the um, URL is there for you. All of these slides um, that, that will be made available to everyone uh, right, after the, uh, right after the webinar. I think that's... And then this one, uh, in terms of our dissemination strategy, that really brings us to today's webinar and really um, the dissemination strategy thus far, we have uh, conducted multiple webinars and demonstrations over the last uh, year. We have reached out to the majority of uh, department chairs and colleagues through the Pediatric Chairs of Canada. We also have connected with all program directors um, around, across our residency programs in the country. And, I, and there's approximately 50% of our um, residency programs that are actually using the curriculum on the go at this point, which is, which is very, very exciting. We want to increase that number. We want to increase engagement and utilization, but I think we're off to a very exciting start. And we've also disseminated and shared the tool in live uh, demonstrations, et cetera, with all of our CAFC organizations. And that, of course, represents all of the children's hospitals in the country and many more community hospitals, rehab centers, uh, et cetera, from uh, coast to coast. Forward, we need to expand our reach. And we're really looking to everyone online and many other colleagues to help us do that. We want to expand that reach to faculty. We want to expand the reach to residents, undergraduates, identify and engage with our champions. And I'm hoping that everyone, we can, we can truly refer to all of you online today as part of that champion leadership group engagement of our community, and it really is reaching out to your respective communities. Ultimately, um, the goal being to grow the curriculum, to increase the engagement, to get feedback um, from our users, in fact, to make, it, uh, to make it better. The purpose of today's webinar um, is to highlight the importance of patient safety education and the ultimate impact on child health and safety to provide an introduction and overview of patient safety education tools that are available to you um, on the curriculum on the go, sharing experiences and challenge in bringing patient safety to organizations, and introducing and perhaps talking openly about strategies and, and successful strategies um, that others have used to, in fact, engage 
discuss the importance of faculty engagement and offer strategies, as I've, as I've said earlier, actually, and really to look to you to become part of our leadership group uh, in, helping us, uh, in helping us do this. All right. Um, is, are, are, there any, are there any thoughts or questions just before I, I uh, welcome Lennox? Okay. Um, it is my pleasure at, at this point in time to turn the, the virtual um, podium over to Dr. Lennox Wong. And Lennox, of course, is, is a colleague and chair and chief of the Department of Pediatrics at McMaster University. Um, Hamilton Health Sciences Center, as well as uh, St. Joe's Healthcare in uh, in Hamilton. Uh, Lennox, thank you for your participation and leadership, and it's my pleasure to uh, turn things over to you. Great, thanks, Elaine. Um, so, hopefully, uh, what people have on their screen now should be the, the title slide. Uh, just wanted to make sure that there's nobody who's missing that. All good. Good. So, uh, you know, I'm going to keep the slideshow part of things a little bit more informal, and uh, I'll try and keep my remarks brief so that we have some time for discussion, because really this is, um, I think, a time not just for a white power presentation, but a time for some discussion around uh, potentially strategies to have even more engagement uh, for, for this really important curriculum. Um, what I'll do is I'll provide a bit of perspective from, from the chair chief standpoint. Um, I, I, in the acting role for a bit over a year uh, for, for the chair side of things. And now as I go into the full-fledged role, I think I'm starting to get a bit more perspective on the chair side. The chief side I've been doing for a couple of years now, so I could probably speak to that uh, fairly well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about general importance um, and then some opportunities too. And hopefully this will tie into the faculty engagement uh, side of things that we're gonna talk about a little bit later. There are a few assumptions. Um, and these are some of the assumptions I've made of the audience, so we, we won't talk in great detail about the Swiss cheese model. I'm not going to talk in great detail about uh, the IOM 1999 report, and, and, and uh, I'll try not to talk too much about the Hudson either. Even though virtually every single patient safety presentation and conference I've been to, uh, there, there's at least some reference to this. So this is the last of the reference uh, to, to these uh, particular issues. The assumption here is that everybody uh, is on the webinar because they understand that patient safety is important that, and that education really is needed. Um, so th those are the basic assumptions uh, going forward. What do we know about patient safety and education? Well, where the evidence and literature is growing, and I think it's been growing exponentially over the past uh, handful of years. A large part of this really is mostly consensus and expert opinion and, uh, and frontline uh, staff opinion as opposed to higher levels of evidence. But this is what we think we know. We think that uh, single encounters are not sufficient for education around patient safety, meaning um, you know, you're, you're going to take the opportunity with the resident that you're with on the ward, but that's really probably not enough. Uh, you need something more. Uh, we should be starting early, and so uh, perhaps starting with associate professors or full professors and teaching them about patient safety, probably not the way to go for long-term sustainability. There's been, uh, in the literature, uh, numerous references to competency-based approaches and, and a need and a call for a need for standardization of curriculum and approach. They've certainly done this in Australia. They, there's talk of this in the U.S. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I think in many ways we're leading the way in Canada with our Cross Canada uh, curriculum put on uh, through via the pediatric chairs. Um, despite all of these these calls for a standardization for, uh, for for education starting very early, there's actually relatively little out there that's been formalized. Um, and what I'm, I'm actually missing one slide, but I had another slide where I talked a little bit about um, both from an undergraduate perspective and a postgraduate perspective, um, how we could tackle this and what other places have done. They actually have shown that um, for among undergraduate students, having a curriculum that stretched multiple years, so you have a couple of seminars in year two, a couple in year three of clerkship, was effective in, uh, and if you think about the Moore's outcome pyramid, it was effective at a learning level. Um, it, hard very much to show that something is effective at the practice level, 
Um, there's plenty of evidence around there around the satisfaction level. The, the bulk of what we know is at the learning level, meaning that after having uh, X number of courses at the secondary level, X number of courses at third year level, people were more likely to retain a certain body of knowledge around patient safety. Uh, for postgraduates, so residents, there, there has been some uh, evidence that shows that a formalized curriculum makes them better at analyzing patient safety events. So they're, they're better able to see at a systems level what are some of the issues that contribute to uh, patient safety. Um, so, so that takes it up just a, a, a further notch because you really, you're starting to get into the practice side of things. In terms of other patient safety curriculums, and you're going to, you've seen an introduction, and you probably hear a bit more of this. Um, there's the WHO, which is really a bit more research oriented. Uh, the AAP has a website for patient safety, and this, uh, both of them are actually linked in our in the patient safety curriculum that we present uh, to these resources. One of these, I think, addresses. Uh, certain subsets. So the AP is really focused a little more on a CME um, maintenance of certification uh, style of learning, uh, where they have one-hour webinars and and uh, you can check off boxes and then tell your your state board that yes, you in fact have done some CME. And the WHO takes a bit more of a research bent to things. I think what we don't have quite as much, except for our curriculum, is a more comprehensive approach and one that could be extended across really a whole spectrum of learners, uh, including current healthcare professionals. So the chief perspective. Um, virtually all the pediatric chairs are also chiefs at their respective institutions across Canada. I think there's, there's one institution that's an exception, but for all of the others, 16 institutions, the, the, the chairs are also chiefs at their institution. And the chief role is uh, tied directly to quality of care. So in a lot of ways, you actually live um, the, the six domains or six competencies uh, of, of patient safety. Uh, there's there's a constant talk of patient safety, um, but among what, what I find is that among uh, faculty and practitioners, we, we lack a bit of a common approach. Um, and most people, uh, because really this this movement's really taken foot in the past ten years, most of the faculty members that that, that you're going to be having in among your group will have not received any formal training. Um, and so they lack a lot of the tools to address these patient safety issues. So on the one hand, as a, as a chief, you're charged with um, improving patient safety at your institution. On the other hand, you're, you have a body of people um, and, and more new people entering the group who perhaps don't have all of the tools necessary to provide an effective approach, which really stresses the need uh, for uh, a common curriculum and one that uh, could be extended uh, uh, really across um, all learners. Mm -hmm. Now, if I take another bent from the chair perspective, um, the, the, the chair has a dual responsibility to faculty and also to the learners coming through the institution. So what are faculty interested in? Most of your academic faculty are going to be interested in scholarship in addition to the clinical care. And uh, for, for us here at McMaster, the bulk of our faculty are uh, in the clinician educator realm. And so scholarship in education is a very key part uh, of their promotion and tenure. Um, and how do people get promoted? Well, uh, really it's based on sustained contributions to education. So, uh, and this is over time and there's a quality aspect to things too. And then there's a further um, delineation of this. And we talked about this actually at the recent uh, uh, North American Chairs uh, concept meeting in San Diego, and there really are the three P's of scholarship, the, the product, the peer review, and, and making things public. And on the one hand, while in all exchange network and our curriculum, the product's already there, I think there's a lot of potential to use that product both in an educational setting uh, and then potentially also in a study setting to have further education research around uh, around patient safety. There's also this growing recognition that quality improvement can also be seen as a, as a scholarly activity. I think if you were to ask around uh, the chairs uh, probably 10, 15 years ago, um, quality improvement has really tended to be seen as distinctly a hospital administrative type thing. But more and more we see that uh, whether it's the pediatric quality sector, the, the, the 
section in pediatrics, which deals with quality and has publications available to uh, distinct journals dedicated to this, that really is a recognition that quality improvement can, and in fact is, a scholar, scholarly activity. One of the challenges that, that, that I hear all the time from, from my faculty is, well, there's just this tremendous need for education, and really we don't have time for all of this. And um, when you have a certain need, and we can talk around the need from the learners next, when you have a certain need and uh, there's a group of people that do need this education, I think asking people to come up with new curriculum to go through and try and dig up through the, the hundreds of resources available through the web to find the best resources that apply to certain domains and competencies is probably not the most effective use of their time, uh, especially if there's uh, an existing tool out there. So in a lot of ways, I see this curriculum as a time-saving tool for faculty members who are interested in patient safety, interested in education, and really want to take a bent uh, towards scholarship in this, in this particular area. Now, from a learner perspective, uh, there's certainly a there's certainly this need to incorporate patient safety into the resident curriculum. It's a Royal College uh, need. Um, but we also have to think about how do we integrate it in multiple other stages. Because there's evidence out there that says that um, it's you can't just do it on a one-time basis. And that to have reinforcement um, at multiple years and along the way is, is something that's crucial. So how do we integrate this? Uh, I can tell you here uh, at McMaster, we have, what, we plan, I would like to do, and what we have done. Um, so the competencies and the domains have actually been in, integrated into our hospital-wide morbidity rounds. Um, it, there, it's, uh, we try and take a systems approach to uh, these morbidity cases, which uh, and there's a morbidity rounds every month where these things are presented. We try to incorporate a bit into the mortality rounds, although it's a little bit different, but again, a system-based approach. Um, what we'd like to do is integrate a bit more into the half days, although I suspect, uh, at, as with uh, our institution, most institu institutions have uh, at least a one to two year plan on the academic half days. So it does make it a little bit trickier. Uh, where I think you really could integrate it is more on the divisional rounds. So uh, for us in our critical care group, our emergency medicine group, our NICU group, their general pediatric group, all have regular academic rounds um, most of these cases, at least once a week. And there's really a great opportunity here to take some of the materials that the, the curriculum brings together for presentation and discussion at these different rounds. Um, and then clerkship curriculum is another thing that we're looking at trying to integrate with, uh, with working with PubDoc around uh, incorporating the patient safety curriculum into that, uh, where we already have the standardized materials. I won't talk too much about the engagement of faculty, uh, other than to say, uh, other than to stress the importance. And I'll, it's important actually to the initiative that we have some engagement of a uh, number of faculty across Canada. And, and that's because the way this is built up is it's a wiki approach. And if, if, you're, if you're on Wikipedia, and I'm pretty sure most of the people have at least been on Wikipedia a couple of times, um, you understand that the quality and fidelity of that information is really based on the number of users um, accessing it and then committing to update um, that information as things change. So this is by no means a static body of information. Um, and, and it really, in, in some of these, if, when you scroll through and you look through the curriculum, there are, there are hot links to specific websites. So if, uh, if a particular part of the curriculum is not accessed for one or two years, you would, could imagine that some of these things would stagnate, and that's one of the things that we really don't want to uh, have happen. The other thing we do want to have happen, too, is that as more evidence comes into patient safety in terms of how you approach things, as more uh, resources become developed, we really want to capture the, really the best of these resources and tie that into the curriculum. I think, uh, from a chair chief perspective, again, this this is an ideal tool, an ideal way to engage uh, younger faculty with an interest in, in uh, quality assurance and patient safety. And I can tell you, as uh, having interviewed dozens of people for various positions, that's probably one of the more common interests that I see among um, recent graduates from fellowship programs that. 
they really are interested in, in these uh, areas, and, and many of them don't know where to get started. So I think this is one of the areas in which, uh, whether it's yourself, whether it's a peer, uh, if you're a chair chief, that you can engage uh, some of the, the junior faculty. And then I'm going to bring this right back to the, the six uh, domains. And I think as for, for all, everybody who are, who's on this teleconference, we're really looking at uh, domain number one from our perspective, meaning that simply by the act of participating in this teleconference, we're starting to work at contributing to the culture of patient safety. And as leaders in each of our own ways, I think that's where our responsibility lies. Uh, and, and my hope is that um, this is, will start a discussion, will start some uh, engagement, um, and that uh, what will build is that we're going to continue along this diffusion of innovation curve and go blow past the early adopters and really start to have this take off among uh, many people across Canada. That's it for my slides. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want to open up for discussion now. Do you want to do this a little bit later? I'm happy to take any questions. I'd like to suggest we do both because I think you've you've brought some really important points to the forefront. So why why don't we open it for for questions? And just while we're letting people think about that, I just wanted to welcome Susan Bannister, who's joined us as well. And and Susan, of course, is calling in from Calgary. I believe. Welcome, Susan. It's great to have you with us as well. Oh, thank you very much. Sorry I'm late. Okay. So any any questions for, for Lennox or thoughts, not just questions, but, but your own experiences and, and, and your thoughts to uh, to what Lennox has uh, has shared with us. Wanna anybody wanna take a stab? Um, Elaine, maybe I it's Adele from Toronto. Um, maybe I could take a stab at just maybe to, to update people as to what we did a few weeks ago. Um, Anne Matlow, myself, and Michelle Batiste, just further to what Lennox was saying about interested fellows and faculty. Michelle Batiste is one of our rheumatology fellows who's developed an interest in safety and has done the, um, the certificate course. And the three of us put together a workshop for the residents using the um, Using um, the the toolkits and and uh, the information available through the through the things that have been developed, and we had a really good experience. Anne can speak to it as well. We brought a parent in, who um, for, who was there for the entire time and also spoke with the residents. We had three sort of mini didactic pieces. We had lots of interactive activities. We had the residents doing things, and the reviews were fantastic. I, I would add to that that Adele cautioned us in that. Some of the feedback she'd been getting is that the soft stuff wasn't necessarily going over with a bang at these sessions, that people much preferred to hear the latest on cardiology and all the hard clinical stuff. So we went in there really that it could be done and we're absolutely thrilled with the feedback. I was bowled over. They really appreciated having the parent there and it's like the light bulb went on what this was all about. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 it's Elaine. I, I think that's so key is is that light bulb, you know, that you've just referred to. And I think we've all seen that happen when it happens. When that that's the engagement we're talking about, and then people realize the value and importance, and 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 it will become infectious, and uh, and and become part of part of what we do. But. We we need to we need to do we need to keep championing it just just as you just as the example that uh, you and Adele have just given. It's other a, other thoughts or comments at at this point. Yeah, Lennox here. I think uh, engaging trainees, uh, be it residents and fellows, um, with this curriculum is is absolutely vital because when you think about it, one of the things that we do evaluate. Um, and hope from uh, from our trainees is that they become teachers as well, um, and that's one of the one of the key aspects. And then sometimes I find that they may be up for a certain presentation; they're not quite sure where to start. And this is an amazing opportunity for them to to get engaged, pay, take a piece of the curriculum, uh, work with a faculty member, and then uh, perhaps be the, the leader or the, the um, teacher around this for perhaps a group of clerks, um, depending on how your particular programs are set up. Exactly. 
and and the and, and we hope that that people will see the the curriculum on the go as a as a tool as as having the work done for you, if you will, for the teacher, for the trainer um, to use, and and uh, so you're not you're not needing to find the time to build the tool, the teaching tool. It's there. You own that tool um, as being a part of our our community. Uh, it's Anne, uh, Elaine, if I could ask Lennox, I really like the the way you've put it as a wiki that everybody would contribute. It would be like a living living document, a living series. And um, Elaine, you say that everybody has um, sort of the foundation tool, but I, I'm sure you've thought of or we all can continue to think of how to make this living and how to have it keep growing and when somebody thinks of something, add it to it. So I really like that wiki idea. Yeah, and that, that actually is, is, um, is, is such an important point, and, um, and it's why, you know, if you'll recall just from my few opening remarks, at that workshop, that very important workshop that we had, program directors, et cetera, um, that's where this concept really came from, is not the concept of wiki, but to go this route, because in fact, it, it, it doesn't become static and it continues to grow and it benefits from the learnings the practitioners, the teachers, the learners can add to the tool at any point. If I could just ask um, ask folks, we're getting a little bit of background noise um, if, if sometimes if there's shuffling of paper or whatever too close to the telephone microphone that can happen. So um, if you're not speaking, maybe just mute mute your line would be uh, would would be helpful. Okay. Any any other thoughts or comments at this point? And 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 keep keep sort of those juices going as as we continue the webinar. Any anybody else want to add anything? This is Susan Dancer from Calgary. I'm the chair of Pop Talk. And Lance, it was great to meet you uh, last week in uh, Comsep and the Amspedec meeting. But I think um, this is something, the patient safety stuff, we could, um, as many of you know, we're developing a national undergrad PEDS curriculum, and we'd be happy to link um, the patient safety um, part to our curriculum. So then when people are, if medical students or teachers are looking at our curriculum, they could link to the and you know when they see the patient safety, they could link to this as a resource. It would be, I think that'd be great to do. Susan, I I agree, and that's something we can do easily, and um and and something really we should do, and 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 that's one example of of the importance of linking to existing curriculum, other other programs, and and if there are others who can think of that should be made, um, mention them on today's call and or subsequent to the call, that would really be um, very, very helpful. And linking concept. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts before we go to our uh, live demo? Okay. It, it's my pleasure at this point, Lennox. Thank you, and and I, I know we're going to come back to uh, to some of the key messages that you've delivered. That was really really terrific. Thanks so much for doing that. Um, it, it's my pleasure now just to uh, to bring Lisa to the to the virtual podium, and uh, Lisa's going to take us on a tour. And I'm assuming now on everybody's screen, you are seeing welcome to the Knowledge Exchange Network. Everybody with us? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. So over to you, Lisa. With thanks. Hi. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to uh, to show the the uh, Knowledge Exchange Network uh, to you, and thanks for coming out today. And so as Elaine explained a little bit earlier, we did launch this curriculum on the go community of practice uh, in April 2010, and we've launched it on our Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, so the can is it's a wiki-based interactive online community. And it was developed with a focus on sharing and growing and creating knowledge and sharing leading practices in different areas of the child and youth health uh, uh, delivery. So initially, it was developed for the continuity and coordination of care of children with complex needs. 
but it, uh, it has expanded to include many categories and support information exchange for all these different communities. So you can see that there are quite uh, a number of categories in here. So it's, it's set up very simply, just like a Wikipedia. So you have your categories, and uh, the activity stream over here shows the people who have recently added things or uh, made contributions or comments um, uh, to the site. So unlike a static website, it does just that. It encourages and allows uh, timely revisions, like we've been talking about. Uh, like Lennox said, we don't want things to get stagnant. So it allows these timely revisions to the content, and it allows interaction with uh, the authors and the creators of the content. And it also allows the community to provide feedback and to work to improve the content. So um, we, we're the keepers of the work. Everybody who's an author, everybody who's a member um, is involved in making sure that uh, this is the most up-to-date and, uh, um, and it's relevant and it's, it's what, we, what everybody needs. So the Ken community uh, includes practitioners, administrators, policymakers, researchers, educators, patients, and families. And there are three levels of access to the Knowledge Exchange Network. It's a public site. Anybody can find it on the internet. It's, uh, it's on the CAFC website. So it's very easily found. Uh, and so the public can browse, search, and view any, anything on here. But uh, when you become a member of the CAN, you're um, then able to submit comments or join a discussion group. Upgrade to the level of, uh, of an author, then you can create and share content and uh, create your own discussion groups, um, improve, edit, update content, and basically you're going to facilitate collaboration. Go to the Safety Competencies Curriculum on the go. So, and as we said before, uh, this work was done in partnership with the uh, Pediatric Chairs of Canada and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, and with um, a lot of work done by the uh, program directors and our, our steering committee. So, the, um, the curriculum is um, organized by domain. And there are many different pages in here. It gives a little bit of the background. We're just going to hop right into um, domain one, contribute to a culture of patient safety, because that's where it um, all begins, right? Mm -hmm. So within each of the uh, domains, uh, there's a relevant resources, uh, recommended readings, different attachments, and these include PowerPoint presentations, case studies, and facilitator uh, guides uh, for the case studies. And uh, each, uh, each of the domains lists the key and enabling competencies, uh, plus all of the learning objectives uh, within each domain. It's kind of similar to a CANMEDS format. So you can see that there's all the, in the first domain, we have all the key and enabling competencies listed. Won't go through those because there's so many. The learning objectives are clearly laid out. And uh, we have the content. So the content includes all of the resources that have been created and shared uh, to help support the learning objectives. And they're, they're all linked to the uh, specific resource. And now the, the, the real exciting part is, is that uh, the development committee set it out in, under teaching methodologies, laid it out in different sessions. They took the resources that were created and uh, they helped to um, prepare different types of sessions for you. So three hour sessions, two hour sessions, one hour sessions, have half an hour. Or, you know, combine things however you like. At a three-hour session, there is a, um, a, a thorough background uh, presentation on patient safety culture. And then you can include a discussion of uh, just culture. And then you can also look at um, um, a case study by um, a physician based on her own, uh, uh, on her own experience. 
and she also developed a facilitator guide uh, that has questions and to simulate discussion and it shows all the linkages to the competencies. So I could start clicking on everything and opening all these different documents, but I think this is something that you can probably go through yourselves and uh, see um, something that might be relevant to you and to your program or your organization. And so I, I'd really encourage you to take some time and look through all of these. Um, there are, there's the ability, once you're a member, here, I'm going to, I'll log in just to show you, because I am a member. So, if I've used something and I've and I've um, it's worked well for me, I had a good experience. I can put a little note beside it, right in there, to say three-hour session. Control M, and I can write a little note to say. Um, Use these resources at <laughs> McMaster. <laughs> sure. They are great. And we yeah. get no points for spelling, <laughs> for spelling or, or typing. typing. <laughs> but I'll just cancel that for now because I didn't use them. But you can, um, and that's something that's very helpful if people can um, comment right on the particular. Um, resources themselves or at the very end at the bottom of every page there's a place to leave comments if you have a general comment about anything that you've read or seen. Now what we really want um, you to do is to become a member and to become an author. Uh, becoming a member is really easy. We could um, go through those things easily. It's like uh, signing up for pretty much anything else on on the web. First name, last name, your login ID. That's what you want um, people to see you as. If they want, you know, mine is Lisa Stromquist. That's who, who people see me as. And uh, your password, email address. And you'll receive once you fill this form out, um, you will receive an email that you must respond to. If you don't respond to it, um, you don't become a, a member. It's, it's um, I think, very similar to most of uh, registering for anything online. Once you become a member, you can request to become an author. Now, what we've done for the, um, the curriculum on the go is it's, it's more of a uh, closed group for authorship. You have to um, be accepted by the administrator and uh, uh, after discussions with the program directors, um, they only want people to use their um, institutional um, email addresses. They want to make sure that people from the programs or from um, healthcare organizations are the only ones who are actually providing the educational material. And again, these are the things in a, in a wiki type environment. The wiki philosophy is that Everybody needs to be able to um, um, to add material and um, and contribute, but we do want to make sure that we're we have a little bit of quality control. Mm -hmm. We don't want somebody going in and uh, who maybe doesn't know anything about patient safety <laughs> and and putting and uh, and contributing things or making um, comments or or um, that statements that are inappropriate. So as the moderator of the community, I would uh, keep um, I would keep that under control and I, and I go in there every day to look at it, make sure that um, things look appropriate. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so there's no fear that way. Um, so we know we know that um, all of the programs, are currently teaching patient safety in uh, many creative ways. 
and that organizations are doing that in day-to-day -day practice. But with limited time and resources that we've uh, spoken about already today, um, having a large variety of teaching materials and methodologies available benefits all programs and all organizations. So these domains provide um, a really great framework to gauge what is being taught in, in, in your program and maybe what gaps uh, exist. So ideally, we would like uh, representation from um, programs. And, and beyond and programs. Beyond, and beyond yeah, programs and faculty. other faculty. Yeah. And um, I don't know if, uh, in the interest of time today, we won't uh, go through everything that's on here and we won't, I won't teach you how to create pages or, or add um, information. But that's something, if you're interested in doing this, it's, it's uh, a very user-friendly uh, format and um, I would be more than happy to give you a private demonstration on how to edit and uh, how to add materials. You can add in uh, videos, you have a number of videos up, and um, it's, easy. it's uh, links and PowerPoint presentations and any other case studies uh, are, always, um, are always welcome. And so anecdotally, we know that uh, many programs are using the material from the site and that is really a great first step, but as we've said, we, we don't want it to become stagnant. We want it to be living and breathing. So uh, the more people who use it, the more people who become involved and can contribute, um, the better it, it, it will be. And I think it really it has potential to, to be an, an amazing um, uh, Canadian and national resource. And uh, I think it's something that we could all take pride in. So does anybody have any questions about um, about the site? Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Is there anyone online who, who has used the site as an author or member? <clears throat> so we uh, used it when we were creating our half day. This is Adele. And it was uh, actually one day I couldn't get on, but then it all got sorted out. Lisa sorted me out. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, then we used it. And, it. and it was great because we sort of knew what we wanted to talk about, but we partly wanted to use the site to um, to see kind of how it worked. And, and it was good. We used some stuff from the site, but we also used some stuff that we had from other places. So it was a good combination. Fantastic. Fantastic. Good stuff. Okay. Alan, I've also been on it just to see my way around it and to see how it was going. And um, I, think it's, I think it's been a fabulous transition from the – site we had before. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Yeah, of course, you, you, you've, you've been part of the authorship of this all the way through, and, and, and it, is, it is getting better, and I think as a wiki uh, platform, it really is going to serve as well. Any, any other thoughts or questions for Lisa, more on the practical, practical side of the tool? Okay. And I would challenge everyone to take Lisa up on her offer of those personal demonstrations and or, um, you know, if there, if you have colleagues or other faculty member, junior faculty who, who would be interested in, in that sort of personal tour to really be able to touch and feel it and ask some questions one-on-one, -on -one, um, that really is part of Lisa's role and commitment. To, to really bringing this to a higher profile and utilization. So please, um, please take, take Lisa up on that, uh, on, on that offer. Okay. At this point, um, it, uh, it again is, is my pleasure to, to welcome and thank uh, Ann Matlow. Um, Ann needs no introduction, Ann, is, but I will just take a moment. As Associate uh, Director, University of Toronto Center for Patient Safety at the SickKids site. Anne is also the Medical Director of Patient Safety and Infection Prevention and Control at SickKids and a tremendous colleague, champion of uh, quality and, and, and patient safety. So Anne, um, I'd love to turn, turn things over to you, please, and we'll bring your presentation up on the screen. That's great. Thank you, and hi to everybody. Um, uh, Anne, do you want me to... Um, I think so, your... Lisa, because um, I think you're in the driver's seat for my presentation. So All righty okay. then. And Anne, don't hesitate to just say next slide, and, and uh, you know we'll 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 follow your lead. 
No problem. So let me just say in advance, my, my topic is about engaging physicians in quality and patient safety. And I realize that on the phone now, I'm preaching to the converted. Um, the perspective that I've taken in this talk um, is uh, it's almost starting from scratch when an organization wants to engage its physician body. But th that said, um, uh, I think it's applicable in our situation where we've got the leadership that wants to do it, but how do you how do you get it out there? So, uh, so this is where we're starting: engaging physicians in quality and safety. And um, Lisa, if you could move on to the next one. So I, I'm basically going to divide it into two objectives: what to discuss what the challenges are in engaging physicians in patient safety and uh, how, to, how to get around them, how, how to embrace, get physicians to embrace and participate in the quality and safety agenda. Next, please. So again, preaching to the converted, a reminder that um, we have data from adult studies primarily about what the rate of adverse events is um, around the world. These are national studies, and I always say if you just remember the Canadian numbers, it's pretty bang on the middle of all the others. So this is Ross Baker's data, 7.5% of adults uh, experience an adverse event, and a third of them are preventable. I, I, should, I will just tell you that um, many of you uh, on the line have been involved in this pediatric, Canadian Pediatric Adverse Event Study. So we've had Ross Baker work with us in repeating the study with, in children across Canada. And we do have our preliminary numbers. And it, in essence, again, we, it has to be, um, uh, the weighting has to happen to the, to the data. But roughly, the, the numbers are the same. We had 6.7% of children across the country, and uh, the rate was higher in academic hospitals, but the preventability was more in the community hospitals. So if anybody asks, is there a problem in pediatrics, the answer is no. It's, it's the same as it is in adults, at least the same. Next, please. And again, our challenge getting from where it is right now in terms of um, uh, rates and consequences. Uh, if you press it, Lisa. Yep. So we are in the 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 range of adverse events. So when you talk about surgical site infections, your 2% drug events might be, you know, 1%, 1 in 1,000. And our goal is really to press again to move healthcare so that it's more where some of the more highly reliable organizations are. And the fact that anesthesia has been able to get there gives us some hope that the medical specialties are able to do it, but I know you guys all know that. So moving on then. So I, I need not tell you that Doctors do care about the quality of their patients' care. It's why they and why we wake up every morning. So to say, it almost sounds like an anathema to have to say how to, you know, how to engage uh, physicians in quality and safety when the quality and safety of our patients is something that we breathe. Next, please. Uh, however, when you go, and I think Lennox alluded to this a little bit, um, certainly what I've heard in different circumstances, and many of you may have as well. I don't have the time. I'm already involved in one of those things. As so-and-so, they're much better suited to this kind of work. This was one that truly horrified me, but maybe it was a um, uh, an eye-opener, what's in it for me. And finally, uh, just a simple no. Next. Uh, so why is it so difficult? Next. So again, doctors do care about the quality of their patients' care. It's why they wake up every morning. We said that already. And in fact, when you hear, I, I think people, our, our partners get their back up when you hear that we have to improve the quality of care. Um, we're all very proud people, and we think we're, we're always doing the best for our patients. So 
when you say we have to do better, 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 it automatically sort of gets you in your gut, and I think it gets people's back up, and part of our messaging has to be somewhat different. Next, please. So physician culture, this has been written about widely. Um, we are trained to be autonomous. We have been educated in silos. We take pride in ourselves as, as diagnosticians, and diagnoses are made by individuals as a rule. So that's the autonomy, self-regulation and governance. We, um, we do have that as a professional body, aspiring to excellence, uh, individual performance, um, responsibility, we take the responsibility, but synchronously we're willing to take the blame if something that we did results in harm. And adaptability, you know, we are adaptable to, to complex and unsafe systems. You know, if you have to work an extra shift because someone didn't show up or you have to wake up in the middle of the night and do a case in the, in, uh, in the OR, well, you do it because you have to and you do, you make it as safe as possible. So, to say that we're not always on our guard and trying is would not be quite the case as most people would see it. Next, please. So with that as the backdrop, you can see how we're at a time of change, so people get their, uh, to feel uncomfortable with this new lingo of um, instead of being an individual practitioner that you have to work as a team and you have to think of the system and work as the system. There's perceived threats, the autonomy, power, status, and income. The cynicism of whether this is just a passing passing trend, uh, and then you just sort of sit back, become complacent, and just wait till it rolls by. And then the whole notion of if you, you know, from a social science point of view, people stick together, and if you find enough like-minded people who think this is um, just a bunch of crap, then uh, you sort of can reinforce it within your own group and not try to get involved. So uh, you can you can stay away from it and sort of avoid or evade the fact that, that you should be getting involved. Next, please. So there, then there's a whole other factor, which is the, the factor around promotion. Next. And um, again, Lennox uh, talked about this, the whole thing that right now it does look like there is, we are gaining credibility or there is a move to have quality improvement and safety be part of an academic stream. So it's uh, up to the decanal committees and the um, clinical chiefs, as, as we've heard, the chairs, and somehow to get the message across that this is indeed a viable career pathway in academic medicine. And this was a great article um, by some of our Toronto adult medicine colleagues in JAMA in 2009. And next slide, please. Uh, so again, I'm not going to go through this, but this is in the same article, and you can see there are uh, three streams of activity. Um, on the left, recognized as having academic merit, worthy of academic merit, and the, the one on the right is not so, not so worthy. But the point is that you can engage in QI activities and still make it uh, of academic credibility and, and credence to contribute to promotion. Next, next slide. But then there's the other factor, and uh, I think this one we're going to hear more about, and it gets to that thing, that uh, idea, what's in it for me, or do we have to start thinking of some incentivization to get people involved in QI patient safety activities? So to that end, next slide, please. I should have put the cash in dotted marks, but this was a hot off the press article that just came out maybe last week. Um, Alan Detsky in Toronto, aligning incentives for academic physicians to improve healthcare quality. And he and his colleague really take this question, uh, take it head on. So got a couple of, of balloons that are gonna come up right now. And this is um, the essence of what the article is about. The starting point is, Frankly, this is their last paragraph, but it's, it's really what their thesis is. Acad 
academic physicians do not currently, as a community, expend enough effort on improving healthcare quality. Next. Examination of the incentives they face in setting their priorities may offer an explanation as to why this is so. So if they're going to get more points by participating in a, a, a research project or writing a paper, um, then it is a disincentive to spend that time engaged in QI activity. Next, please. However, th that, that doesn't wash. The heroes of the hospitals can not only be physicians who achieve global renown by discovering a new gene, but also must include those who improve health outcomes for the hospital's own patients. And finally, Lisa? A combination of financial and non-financial incentives will be most effective. And in essence, what, what they're really saying is that you almost have to look at your people or get a feel of what's going to turn your, your what, what is at the root of what makes pe people tick. Some may be more academically inclined and want to go the promotion route, so have it contribute to that. But if you just have, you know, good, solid clinicians that just want to take care of patients and see things getting better, maybe um, even a non-financial that is not promotion-oriented, you know, featured on the front page of the bulletin or of the annual report or something. Um, so financial doesn't get me. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, resonate with me just because I hate to say I, I sort of think that's, an antithetical to where we should be going, but maybe that's something we need to be facing. I mean, it almost gets to the point if you need someone to do cardiovascular surgery on you, do you want it to be the person who's the who uh, is the Nobel Prize winner in the laboratory, or do you want someone who's a cutting surgeon who's done a million of them? So maybe it is time to face this uh, this issue. So next, please. So uh, this is a, a great. Um, monograph, or it's a white paper put out by the IHI called Engaging Physicians in a Shared Quality Agenda, and I would just like to feature a couple of points in the final few slides. Next. So they have a six-part framework, and just to read the captions, you need a common purpose, i.e. a shared mental model, reframe the values and beliefs, and I'll be talking about that, get your champions, find the people who are engaged already. Um, not an engaging style. It's sort of short-circuited four and five, but I do uh, invite you to go on the IHI website and, and download it and take a look. Next slide. Uh, and, and there's a, a few premises. We know you can't promote a quality agenda without engaging the doctors, A, because you need them, and B, because if they're not engaged, they have the power to block the initiatives. Next. So what they uh, posit is that to engage physicians, you need to reframe the question. Instead of what can we do to get the doctors on board, it's how can the hospital fit into the physician's agenda. And maybe it's instead of saying thou must get involved in a QI activity, how can we make it easy for you to fit in a QI activity? For example, QI patient safety, I use them together. Uh, and then that, again, another way of looking at things and say, of saying, this is our system, please work in it and, you know, do quality or do patient safety. We need to make our system support, these, support our colleagues in doing their best. So whether it's freeing up their time from other stuff to be able to be able to dedicate to this, again, we can't necessarily see it as an add-on. Uh, go ahead, please. Um, the notion of champions. You need somebody credible, an excellent physician. So that is critical. Someone who's trustworthy and uh, respected by others, confident, articulate, and who's willing to make mistakes and admit to the mistake. So, so accepting the fact that we're we're only human and uh, it will happen, and uh, pick it up and keep on going. Next, please. Um, but. I, uh, this is something that to me is at the, the heart and the heart and soul of the whole issue is leadership and we are all leaders at different levels. 
but um, one cannot ask of others what I feel strongly, what one isn't prepared to either take on, um, model, or at least put their, put ones, or walk the talk. So it, it, it can't just be the talk without the walk. So creating a compelling vision of the future, having realistic goals and pathways to get there, just commitment. And I think that's perhaps one of the reasons, um, you know, in our Ontario Excellent Care for All Act, patient safety is supposed to be right up there, front row and center. Um, but I think that has to become very clear in our training program is it just about learning the content. It's about how to how to effect the content in a way that is the safest for the patient. And um, being more involved in frontline activities. So um, activities are not a means to an end, but rather the end values themselves. So again, the process, not just the outcomes. Next, please. And two new drivers. Um, again, in Ontario, we have that excellent Care for All Act to put quality front row center. But again, um, actually, this is uh, an, an something else in Ontario. So I realize um, this this last comment is in Ontario, but I know it exists in Alberta. Your um, physician performance review process. It's new coming coming to a theater near us in Ontario, but indeed. They're upping, and maybe our Alberta colleagues can tell us more about how physicians actually being assessed as per their contribution to the quality agenda and aligning their own activities with the hospital quality is becoming more and more important. So next. I think I'm in my home stretch. So getting the docs on board, get them involved from the beginning so you hear their voices and you don't, they don't think that they're an add-on, harness their insights, create and make sure you have the same mental model, um, uh, promote teamwork, identify leaders and champions, have resources where they're needed, even if it's to en enable them to have the time to do the quality safety work uh, and teaching, I assume by that, you have to offload something else. Incentives, I don't know what that looks like, and uh, maybe we can toss that around, but leadership as a uh, huge, huge, um, really a rafter, it's a, it's a skeleton uh, foundation for, for what this all really pinges, impinges on or depends on. And next. And uh, I think that's it. And that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I'm sure there are comments and, and feedback and questions. And, and why don't we uh, open it up to, um, to Anne's presentation and really um, everything that we've shared today. Anybody want to want to kick off? It's Lennox here. Um, Erickson from Saskatoon. Oh, go ahead, Eric. So, uh, if, as somebody who's who's relatively new to this, I certainly appreciate re the resources that are that are here. And uh, going forward, I'd, I'd I'd really be interested in hearing other people's experiences on on individuals that they've gotten involved and uh, and what sort of uh, network you've set up in your local centers. Great question. Does anybody want to respond to that in terms of what's been done in your local centers around networking and linking? Any examples to share at this point? Okay. Well, maybe what we maybe what we can do, Robin, is is uh, is keep that um, as everyone I believe understands where. We're recording uh, today's webinar so we can share it with others. There will be a podcast created as well. Um, so that's an FYI for everyone to sort of spread the word through your organizations. But that's something that we can actually maybe put out there in terms of an opportunity for people to share um, recent networks that they've created uh, around promoting the education of patient safety and quality, et cetera. I, I could. I could. Could perhaps share some sick kids activities. It's not necessarily in promoting the education part. Go so ahead two then. parts. I know that Dennis has created a group of quality 
convert, so to speak, um, representatives from the various divisions in pediatrics who are sort of championed with um, effecting some quality activity within their divisions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it may be work that they may have been doing anyway, but it's bringing them all together. And I gather this group meets on a semi-regular basis um, just to share what they're doing and where they're going. Uh, something that I have just started, and it's really in its in its infancy, we've had a few minutes and it will gain traction over the next few months, is that I've put a group of so-called champions together from different divisions and departments around the hospital. So beyond pediatrics to include surgery and anesthesia, et cetera. And what I want, I'm, my goal is to create um, a hospital-wide case-based patient safety round. So a kind of, M and M round, but with a system analysis from a patient safety perspective. So, um, to those, those are good examples. Yeah, now. for those cases that sort of cross cross uh, those the the divisional departmental uh, dotted lines, just to bring people together again to talk about cases for the patient. Um, yeah, that's it. Great, thank you. Seven, it's uh, Lennox here. We, we're, um, what happened actually at the pediatric chairs level is that there's been a call out to try and get uh, key folks at each institution engaged. And we, what we haven't done yet is put together a list. So I think a number of places they're still trying, we're still trying to get a, a group of people. And once we pull together that list, I, th I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be able to grow it and share it across all institutions. Uh, it just hasn't quite happened yet. Exactly. And we we can we can absolutely do that, Lennox, and then take that list, if you will, and put it onto the Knowledge Exchange Network so people can access it there and, and add to it. The so other thing I want to underscore is the um, promotion and tenure side of things. So we actually had I had a breakfast meeting just the other day with uh, all of my associate professors, and one of their large concerns is many people have reached associate professor level by doing some combination of research education and, in many cases, clinical work and quality improvement. With a good number of people fairly heavily improved, uh, fairly heavily involved in the quality improvement side of things, and one of their concerns is really, you know, is there a route or is to go further to full professorship um, along those lines, or have they hit their a proverbial glass ceiling, and, and and one of the things I stress really is that this really is a recognized route uh, to academic scholarship. That it's really being recognized a lot more so internally within our department at our departmental promotion and tenure committee, and I know at many others as well. And then even at a faculty level, as evidenced by uh, uh, the articles in JAMA. So you know, I've started to try and get that message across. I think the key part of the, the difficulty we have is understanding what level of quality improvement counts as scholarship. So it's not just seeing more patients in your clinic and having a few complications yourself, but really taking it up to that next level. Um, and, and once that message is across, I think we're going to find even more engagement. Great. Any, any other comments or thoughts? Hi, it's Ralph from Vancouver. What ahead, we've Ralph. tried to do is take lessons learned from our quality improvement we have a weekly multidisciplinary meeting called Advances in Pediatrics, which very often are case reviews or studies, and we will update people where modern medicine is in relationship to disease X, Y. About once every month, we have a meeting where we will discuss a quality issue. Our most recent one was we took a case of where a patient came to harm because someone had not done medication reconciliation. And we talked a bit about how that medication reconciliation is an important tool for patient safety. Part of it is because it is multidisciplinary and includes pharmacy, includes nurses, medical students, residents, attending faculty. It is a form of bringing to the team issues and getting team input to what are the barriers, for example, to having appropriate med reconciliation. Two which came up is we don't have the parents around and we don't have access to the provincial 
pharmacy database, but it's a useful tool to make everyone feel that safety is everybody's responsibility. That's right. That's right. And that's and, and that's a really, really good point, being everybody's responsibility. One of the things that I'll just add to, to Ralph's comment um, is on the uh, CAFC side of the house and in partnership with uh, PCC and our program directors, we have just recently officially launched something that we're referring to as the Competencies Challenge. And it really is speaking to a similar model, Ralph, to the one that you've just explained. It's more at, at the hospital level across the system. And, uh, and it really is using the same framework of our six domains um, through the safety competencies uh, document and resource that we've talked about today. So we're really trying to bring this um, to our hospitals, to specifically to education and, uh, and clinical care uh, in, in many ways. So I, I really think that that example of your um, regular meetings and, and focusing, bringing that multidisciplinary component together is really, really important in a way that we can accomplish this as well. Any, any other thoughts or comments? Lennox or Anne, did you want the uh, each each take the last word? Um, <laughs> well, I, again, it's like I, I it's wonderful to be preaching to the converted. It's uh, um, I, I think identifying champions, grassroots champions, and allowing the um, it to go like you know, kindling from, from branch to branch, I think, is going to be a strategy, you know, the importance of getting faculty involved to be able to teach the uh, the trainees is going to be something very important. Yeah, absolutely. And having, um, you know, Susan Bannister online with us, and one of one of the leadership roles that Susan has is with, is, is with the undergraduate programs, and, and, uh, and, and I think this is, a tool um, not only linking to your um, curriculum development, Susan, but as a patient safety focus. I think this is something we need to bring to our undergraduate uh, programs as well. Yes, Mrs. Susan, I agree and thank you. And I think um, one of the things in our curriculum in the communicator section is talking about disclosing adverse medical events. So I thought that is part of this patient safety piece, and we can definitely link it in through Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lennox, in, in terms of one, one um, wrap up and just, just your thoughts, final thoughts, and, and uh, I turn over to you. Sure. The, the one thing I think I would hope is that, um, you know, we're a relatively small group today, but if every single person who's on the line today uh, is able to reach out to two, three other people, offline, get them engaged, um, get them involved to check out the curriculum, then I think we, we start to build even more, uh, a larger community out of this. Um, and uh, and the hope is that uh, this is going to take on a life of its own. Absolutely. I, I, I thank you. I, I thank you for sort of bringing that point forward, Lennox. And I think in, in terms of that that commitment to share and, and disseminate the information to, to all that are interested, across your departments, across your organizations. We remain very committed. Um, Lisa, uh, tremendous expertise um, on, on many fronts, on the technical side of, of the CAN and our, and our curriculum. So please, again, take advantage of that. Help us spread the word. Um, today's uh, presentations and, and eventually as a podcast will be up on the Knowledge Exchange Network for you. Lisa's going to send along the link to everyone and um, let folks know that that, that today happened and, and that we will plan other webinars like this uh, going forward to keep engaging colleagues um, from across the country. On, um, on that note, I want to wish um, everyone a, a wonderful weekend. I want to thank Lennox and Anne and, and Lisa for your presentations today. And I'm going to say most importantly, thank you to our champions. Thank you to everyone who participated. And um, I'm looking forward to our continued collaboration. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. We'll be back in touch soon. Bye-bye now.